Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and on this very special edition of L'Chaim, I have the wonderful opportunity to sit with a very extremely gifted creative team who've made a very different kind of Holocaust-related film called The Second Son, a marvelous play on words given the theme of the movie. One of my guests is the film's lead actor, the other, the director of this lovely, deeply touching and moving film about the joy and the complexity of life and human relationships and how love is sometimes a mysterious, miraculous gift of the shared. It's just meant to be. It's my pleasure to welcome to L'Chaim, John Buffalo Mailer. He plays Max brilliantly. You will fall in love with Max, played by John Buffalo Mailer. And I'm also pleased to be joined by the director, who did a brilliant job. And her name is Jennifer Gelfer. She's also a most successful actor herself, as well as being a producer and director. And The Second Son is Jennifer's first feature film. It is so lovely having you with us on L'Chaim. Thank you both for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. And you. Mazal Tov, you did, a fa you did a fabulous film. Thank you. And you are a brilliant actor. And I, again, as I said in the open, I just fell in love with you. And uh, what have you done before, John? I, you know, I've been hoofing it and acting since have I you? was 12 years old. Um, I would say probably the, uh, the, the, the bigger one would be um, Wall Street 2 that Oliver Stone was, was, you know, kind enough to give me a, a decent part in. Lovely. But I have never been given the opportunity to play a part like this until Jennifer took a gamble on me. So and thank you. By the way, you've worked before together, before The Second Son, yes? We worked on a film called Blind together that um, John's brother directed and John wrote and I produced. You wrote Blind? I did, yes. And it's, am I correct that another actor from this film was in that film as well or no? Eden Epstein. Yes. Mm -hmm. Played the female lead in mm -hmm. The Second Son yes. was also in? Blind. Blind. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, how did the script come to the two of you? The Second Son? Yeah. Uh, well, it came to me through s somebody I was partnering with on a web show. Um, an, an actor who was in one of the episodes had reached out to him and said, I have this play. I don't know where to bring it. And he said, well, Jennifer is very good with um, you know, doctoring pieces or editing, helping people edit. So he came to me. We sat and we talked. And I said, well, what's the hook? I said, I don't really quite understand it. And we started talking for hours. And um, at the end of it, I said, look, I have an actor, an actress who I think would be really good for this. She's young. She's, he had written it for an older woman. I said, but I don't see it that way. I see her younger. And I said, I'd like you to do a reading with her. And, um, Are we talking about Eden here? With Eden. Yeah. And Eden was a student of mine. I was an acting teacher. And so I saw how gifted she was, and I wanted her to read this with him. And we read it in my kitchen. And then for the next three and a half years, we developed it um, all over town. We did it at different festivals in New York. We ended up at the Signature Theater, which, which was the last place we did it. And I was lucky enough that John came to see it. And he saw something in the male character that he really wanted to explore. And he came to me and he said, can I have a shot at reading this with Eaton? And I said, well, it's not really, you know, he wrote, the writer wrote it for himself. I said, I really can't do that. And then the writer wrote a screenplay. And uh, I said, well, I'd like to direct this as my first feature. And I said, but I'd like to do it with John. And so John and Eden and a couple of other people sat and read it. And I said, that's it. That's the casting of it. Jennifer says you wanted to do this part. What was it about the character or the storyline that intrigued you enough to say, I want to do this? 
you know, we're, we're living in such a cynical day and age, and, it, and it's, it's legitimately scary. So for me, what I was drawn to about this guy, Max, is that he just refuses to let the tragedy he survived define him. Uh, it's not something he ever forgets. It's something he lives with every day. But he is not going to let that crush him or take away his joy and his faith and his love. And so, you know, to, to see him on this one night when that is really put to the test, I just thought that's, to, to me, that's what it was all about for, for that character. I mean, I think the, the movie, like the play, it's about a number of different things. But for me with Max, I just wanted to bring this guy to life. You know, I wanted to... Just on a, on a personal level, you know, the, the, the stuff that I, the harder stuff that I've faced and gone through, I, I don't want that to be what defines me. I mm -hmm. don't ever want to lose my sense of mm -hmm. it's all going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, James Patrick Nelson, who wrote the, the play and the screenplay, I just thought he had created such a beautiful character in that. So that's why I asked Jennifer if I could, you know, give her, give her this kind of very different take than the play had had on it. I am so interested in some of the things you just referred to. The way you describe it, John, it wasn't simply, well, here's an opportunity for me to work. It was something about it, this that was personal for you. And even if it weren't personal, very important for me to say to you, even if it weren't personal for you, you might have been as brilliant anyway. At the same time, maybe because it was personal for you, some of the brilliance, and I really, I cannot recommend people see this film more. And I want them to see it because of Max, because of you. The film is lovely. It has a lovely arc. There's also surprise in it. There's drama in it. There's pain in it. There's a beautiful love scene in it. All that's in The Second Son. But what comes through is your character as, again, almost a... Um, a metaphorical symbol of what it means to see life in a positive way, regardless of what pain there is. And then you make reference to your own pain. So I don't know anything about your background. By the way, we should get this out of the way. You're the son of Norman Mailer. Okay. Yeah, yes. Mazal tov to you. You have a, very, <laughs> a wonderful father. Thank and it, <laughs> if there's something to say about that, we'll get to that. But it's not about your being Norman Mailer's son. It's about who you are and what experiences you had. To the extent to which you're comfortable, what are some of the difficult moments in your life that gave you an opportunity to deal with them through this part? Hmm. Uh, well, first of all, just thank you for saying that because one of the things Jennifer and I talked about from day one of when she cast me in this was, was exactly that symbol that you speak of, Max being. <clears throat> um, and it was... On a personal level, you know, I spent a, a good portion of my 20s uh, taking care of my parents. My, my, my dad was at an age where he needed it. My mom was battling all, all sorts of different kinds I'm of sorry. cancer. Were you close to your father? Yes. I was, my parents were like my best friends. They, uh, they were incredible. And, um, and, you know, my dad was 55 when I was born. And so we didn't have any of the, uh, the usual father-son competitive stuff. We really just knew that we liked each other, that we didn't have a whole oh, lot of lovely. time together. That's lovely. Um, and so Bowie, was, you have siblings. I do have eight, eight siblings. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> How many are from the same mother? Uh, I am the only one from my mother and father. Uh, my dad was married six times. Um, I have a brother from my mother's previous marriage. So I was, I was, we were in the green room before I was joking. I said, well, you know, having eight, eight <laughs> half siblings doesn't equate to four whole ones. It's, it's a little different. But, uh, you know, in, are in some Are you close ways, to any of them? All of them. All, all of them. them. Yeah, them. But well, that's yeah. unusual as you very, look at it. You know? Very unusual. Well, yeah. I think um, it says something very wonderful about your father and your mother. Certainly. My mother was the glue that really held us all together. Name? Norris Church Mailer. Okay. Uh, she wrote a, a beautiful memoir called uh, Ticket to the Circus, in which she opens up by saying, well, I bought a ticket to the circus. I don't know why I was surprised to see elephants. <laughs> um, Good for your mother. Yeah, she was Hi. incredible. How long were they married? Uh, they were married for they were married for twenty nine years and together for about thirty three, I believe. Okay, so, so this is a long off marriage for you. Long yeah. marriage. I was okay. I was two and a half at their uh, wedding, and I was saying, <laughs> when, are, when are we going to cut the cake? When are we going to cut the cake? <laughs> but, uh, were you close to Norris? Oh yes, she was. Um, as as I say, they were both my my best friends, and, and you know she 
she died way too young. She was just getting warmed up and on top of all the amazing things she did in her life. But um, she was such an inspiration. I feel like one of the reasons why you know you and I came into each other's life is you 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 knew my mom and you know she was kind of a, a fashionista like yourself and that that connection I feel I guess I'll, I'll I'll say I feel both my mother and father looking out for finish, me. Through, finish the thought. Those. What was the texture of your mother? What was she like as a person? Oh, she was. Uh, well, I'll, t I'll tell you. I'll tell you the the balance of my parents. My dad was the kind of guy that you would meet, and immediately he would know more about you than you might even know about yourself. And he would poke you, and he would he would challenge you to be what he could tell immediately you wanted to be. My mother would see the most beautiful thing about you, and she would let you know that she sees it and it's there. And I, I like to think that I got a, a, a fair balance of the two. I, I hope so, to, and to honor that. do you that. feel what you just described, which is beautiful, was how they related to you as well? Did your father understand you? I think, I think he understood me. Uh, about 99%, I think he understood me. I, at, at one point, I remember him saying to me, boy, you know, you have a capacity for love that is almost mysterious to me. And I said, He's well, right. I was, I was a right. love child, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How could I not? And, um, and is uh, your softness in part from your mother? Uh, well, you know, let me not misstate it. She, that part of our family, we come from mule skinners in Arkansas. <laughs> so... She was tough. I mean, she, you know, she was perhaps the toughest person I've ever known. And uh, the grace with which she battled cancer for 12 years when doctors were telling her to get her affairs in order after three weeks was unbelievably inspiring. Uh, but she wasn't combative. She wasn't somebody, she didn't, she didn't like to fight. She, you know, she, she did when she had to, but she was someone who, who enjoyed a good party when everybody was, was feeling good about themselves and being there. What family do you have now? Uh, well, I have an incredible wife named Claudia Marie Mailer, who uh, we met on the set of Blind. By the way, she was in the movie. Oh, yes. yes. She plays the mother of Max as a child. Yes. And she's wonderful. Yeah, I'm no, very, it's, very happy for it's, you. it's lovely to say that you know, the real love of my life plays my mother in the flashback scenes in this movie. We don't, we don't think about it too much. We just enjoy <laughs> it. <laughs> now, your father was Jewish, your mother was not. Yeah. And in terms of your own upbringing and your own identity, where does the Jewish fit in for you? You know, it's, it's, it's so interesting because unlike most of the other religions out there, when you're Jewish, you're treated as if you're part of a race. And, you know, my father was not uh, overly practicing. He was uh, not an observant. He was, he was not. I mean... It, I think more than he knew, Judaism uh, informed a lot of his uh, you think spiritual so? beliefs. Absolutely. His, the last book that uh, was ever published while he was alive is called On God, An Uncommon Conversation. It's certainly not uh, Judaism. It's not that. But uh, in the past five or six years, I've actually studied quite a bit um, and have, have seen whether he was aware or not, whether it was from you know go, going to, to Hebrew school when he was a kid or what, what it was, it informed him. And for me, growing up, you know, as, as half a hick from Arkansas and half a Jewish intellectual from Brooklyn, it was you know I say I'm a Jewish cowboy, you know, where there's there's not many of us left. And um, you know it was a uh, but but that was always the world to me was both. So I never you know felt an allegiance with any side of myself. I just honestly thought, boy, if, you know, if these people could talk to each other more, they probably would get along better and understand each other. Um, so, you know, <laughs> certainly seeing my parents uh, get, get into some of their, their famous fights was uh, hilarious, and I realized, oh, well, <laughs> there are differences. But, <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day... Do you have any sense of Jewish cultural identity? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't see how you, can, how you can be Jewish and not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, as I say, these, these wildly cynical, divisive times we're living in, I kind of love the fact that I'm a Jewish cowboy because mm -hmm. if there's one thing that I want to do before I'm done here, it's everything in my power to unite us and, and to, to fight against the divisive rhetoric that we're seeing, the, the, the fear, all of it. 
But I can't pretend that there haven't been times when I'm down south and someone says, well, you know, how'd you lose the horns? It, it happens. And, you know, you kind of laugh it off and, and you do it. But I don't know anybody who grows up being Jewish and doesn't in some way uh, identify with that. You play a Holocaust survivor in The Second Son. It evolves. We don't know it right away. The scene, the, the movie opens, you're in Goldberg's Bakery. And the character you play, Max, is working in Goldberg's Bakery. And then it's later on in the film, in a very dramatic way, we learn that, you're, that Max is a survivor. So you're playing a survivor. It comes back to my prior comment. I understand you're an actor. You could play anything. But you're playing a survivor. And I wondered in terms of who you are, how you were raised, and your own soul, whether there was some, any part of that that moved you. And I'm not looking for an answer. It could have been, Mark, I was playing a role. Whatever the role was, I would have played it as well as I can. Coincidentally, it was a Holocaust survivor. At the same time, maybe there was something there that meant something to you. So I'm asking. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think one, one of the things that enabled me to, to dive in in the ways that I did was having a father who was World War II generation. So in my household growing up, I understood. Did he ever how, talk about oh, it? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think he was obsessed with it to, to his dying day. His, his last book was a, a Castle in the Forest about young Adolf Hitler and how a, a mm -hmm. devil gets in and, you know, forges him. So, I, you know, that's, it's, it's not something that uh, ever does and I don't think ever should go away. We, this is never something that should be treated lightly because it, it remains this prime example of how terrifying humanity can get if we let it. And so going into to that, I, you know, as, as, as much as I had had my own experiences at the dinner table talking to my father about it, uh, one of the extraordinary things we got to do was um, a uh, virtual reality tour with a survivor uh, at a camp in Poland. So it is literally walking through a camp really? today, and then you hear a voice right behind you, and you turn, and there he is, and his eyes are haunted. He's maybe 90 years old, and he is just walking you through his memories of the place. And I get chills just... just thinking about it, and I, I have to say, I think, in terms of uh, preparing for this part, unless I could have gone to the actual camp and actually been there with him, I don't know what would have given a, uh, a more uh, harrowing sense of watching this man standing right next to me, telling me this story, being there with him. It, it was just a, a, a profound experience that I don't really have the words to, to capture. Um, so. You know, again, the movie is not, it, it, to me, it's not about the Holocaust. It is, the, it's a love story. But it's a love story with someone who has survived the most horrible thing that I can imagine. And, um, and so I just try to take all that and, and put it in. Well, and, good for you. You know, and then, as we say, not, not let it define him. Okay. One more question in this area. Was it hard? Some people find it hard to be the child of a famous person. In this instance, the famous father was Norman Mailer. But was it hard for you as a child to be in the shadow of a, an iconic parent? You know, I think it, it, it always comes with its blessings and burdens. Um, for me, because of the age difference, because we both knew we weren't going to have as much time together as we would have liked, uh, I he didn't. Knew that. Did you know that we, too? Yeah, no. We we both knew. Particularly when my mom got sick as well. It was, you know, their 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 time to cross over was on our minds, and okay. we were we were making the best of every moment. But um, but you know, for me, it's a uh, it's impossible to separate what I would be like if I didn't have Norman mm -hmm. Mailer as my father, Norris Church Mailer as my mother. I wouldn't be me. So it's it, you know, I can't say. I, I've been asked before. You know, would you would you be sitting here if you weren't Norman Mailer's son? I say, well, I, I wouldn't be here at all if I wasn't Norman Mailer's <laughs> son, so I can't answer sort of that. Sort a silly question. Um, well, no, I, I, I get it. I, I certainly understand where it's coming from. Uh, but for me, the, uh, the, the blessings certainly outweigh the burdens. Lovely. It's a nice story to listen to, isn't it? Oh, he's Okay, but now I want to know your story, Jennifer. Oh, okay. oh God, now I'm on the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So where were you born? Uh, New York. 
And who were your parents and what kind of home did you grow up in? Uh, my parents were, my dad was an attorney. My mom uh, was a, an accountant. And, uh, their names? Ruth and George. Ruth and George. Ruth and George. Um, my dad, I was very blessed. I had the greatest dad in the world. Isn't that uh, lovely? Yeah. I mean, I couldn't have asked for somebody better. How was George the greatest dad? He just was incredibly supportive. He believed in me. Um, he taught me. Um, he just gave me my values. He gave me my heart. And uh, he, he just was the perfect father. Did you have siblings? I do. I have a brother who's oh. a child psychologist. Lovely. Older or younger? Older. So you were the younger daughter? Yes. Okay. And he was crazy for you? My dad, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And it sounds like he had a very profound influence on your soul. He did. He, um, well, my dad, um, <laughs> I, I hate I hate to sort of say this, but my dad would take me every Sunday morning and sit with a book on the Holocaust and, um, and read to me from this book. And like what? Um, just about what had happened. Uh, we're talking about in the 60s. So he, he made sure that I always knew about it. Isn't that interesting? What was his Jewish identity? Well, he grew up in an Orthodox home, so he went against it. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't. Uh, practice the religion, but he was very traditional. So holidays meant something. Um, but my father was sort of a child of the Holocaust in terms of he lost his belief in anything that was greater than, you know, what was here on earth. And your mother? My mother never really talked about her belief system. She, when I would ask her if she believed in God, she would say, oh, Maybe. I mean, um, but, but I mean, I grew up in a very traditional Jewish home. Shabbat? No. Um, just, just holidays, mostly. Okay. But, but always, cultural Jewish. But culturally. And a strong sense of Jewish identity. Yes, very strong. Did you go to any kind of Hebrew school, that type of thing? Well, they tried to send me to something called Shalom Aleichem Shalom. Yes. I hated it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so <laughs> I went for like maybe two Sundays, and then I said, nope, not doing this anymore. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I gave my parents a really hard time. And did your brother? My brother was bar mitzvahed and hated it. I hated it. Yeah, because, because it was more for um, business than it was for him, which I think in that period of time, um, a lot of that generation made it about that and didn't make it about the kids. They made it about, will this be good for business? You know, I mean, my parents spent... I shouldn't be saying this, but they spent a fortune that they didn't have for my brother's bar mitzvah to please my mother's father, to please business associates. To you know, They were caught up in that world. Did you in any way feel, why didn't they do that for me? No. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. No, I didn't care about a bar mitzvah. A bar mitzvah. I, um, I was so involved in theater, and that's all Even I Even as a about. young person? Five years old. I knew what I wanted to do. I saw West Side Story, and I went, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so all the kids in my neighborhood were either jets or sharks, and I was always Anita, which I should have played Maria, but I was Anita because I thought she was hotter than She was cool. <laughs> she was cool, and I loved Bernardo. So, <laughs> so yeah. So at five years old, Jennifer's deciding she's going to be an actress. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm not telling you something you don't know. Do you know how many five-year-olds think they're going to be actresses? How many 12-year-olds think they're going to be How many 16-year-olds? And it doesn't happen. It's mm -hmm. very hard I know. to have an acting career. I know. So what happened for you? Where are you in high, where did you go to high school? Uh, Plainview, Long Island. Okay. I graduated uh, early. I got out as fast as I could. And then where did you go to college? I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Oh, very nice. Well, it was okay. And then I went to Lambda. I went to the London very Academy nice. of Music and Drama. Very nice. So, and then that I was went, an experience, yes? That was a great experience. I lived in England for a year. And then I... I Subsequently moved back quite a few times to work. I so you became, a, you were trained as a classical actress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Then you come back to America. What kind of work do you get? Not a lot. It's hard, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It is so hard. Yeah. It's hard. And, and so which will bring me to the story of my dad telling me, find a back door. And I was like, what do you mean, find a back door? Why can't, I was 21. He was like, why can't I go through the front door? What am I, a monster? And he said, just, he said, if you love this as much as you seem to you know, believe, find any door into this. 
And I took great offense at that. And it wasn't until, um, I, I mean, I, I was working, but it wasn't until about 20 years later, and my friend was doing a play on the West End, and um, I was coaching her. And she said, come over and um, do this play with me, and you know, you'll be working with Peter Hall, Sir Peter Hall. And, and I said, yeah, but I need to find a class while I'm there because I want to you know, at least have my muscles being you know, used. And she said, what do you need a, you know, a class for? You have Peter Hall. And I was like, yeah, but that's not enough for me. It's, you know, that's for you, but I need something else. And so I took a lunch with a, somebody from somebody else. And I was looking for an acting class while I was in England. And at the end of that lunch, I walked out. And this woman called me from something called Master Class at the Royal Haymarket. And, she, and I said, oh, did Geraldine tell you that I'm looking for a class? She said, no, Geraldine told me you should teach. So she asked me to come do a class there. I told my friend, and she said, you're doing it. And I said, I don't want to teach. She said, you're doing it. So I went and I taught, and that opened up my whole career. I taught for the Royal Haymarket. I became an associate member. They actually filmed me doing my classes. I would go back like every six months to do a class. This was um, a group that was the patrons were Judy Dench, Peter Hall, um, Janet Suzman. They were you know, all the great dames. you know everybody from um, the London, the English theater. And um, I came back to the States, and I started a class. And they said, you can use our name. So I used the Royal Haymarket. I called it the Haymarket Annex. And I started teaching. And that led to directing, because people would say, oh, could you direct me in something? And I'd say, well, OK. And then I'd direct. And then that led to the web series that I was hired for. And then that led to um, just everything. And it was that back door that my father talked about. Your father was very wise, wasn't he? Was very he? wise. Yeah. Yes. It's amazing how wise parents can be. Yeah. That's a lovely story. Sure. Um, and as you're, as you're growing and becoming more established in your profession, mm -hmm. does the Jewish identity remain with you? It's with me every day. It's who I am. I mean, to be truly honest, when I was a young girl, I tried to escape it. I did not, I changed my name. I was Jennifer Adams. I was Jennifer Allen. <laughs> and then one day, I was on a plane, and this man sat next to me, and I had a magazine open. And he said, what's your name? And I said, my name is Jennifer Allen. He goes, what's your real name? And there was a picture of Jenna Elfman, who I happen to know. And he said, if that girl can be Jenna Elfman, you can be anything. And the next day, I went and changed my name back to my father's name. And I remember going into my acting class, and my teacher had, he was critiquing. He had a pad, and he would see the name on it. And I had been studying with him for years. And he said, who the hell is Jennifer Gelfer? And I said, it's me. I had just done a scene. And he said, who is that? I said, that's my name. That's my father's name. I took it back. And he said, oh, you should have stuck with Alan. And I said, no, I'm going to stick with Gelfer because, for you. because I wanted the legacy. Because I knew I was going to achieve something, and I thought, I want to have that be what goes on. So it's sort of the same question I asked John. I understand if you're an actor, you're a director, you're, you're just looking for good properties that will, that will work and translate into something that people will want to see. At the same time, the second son has this amazing quality. And I'm assuming a lot of that is you, if not all of that is you. And you were lucky enough to have, I, I mean, I think he's a brilliant actor. So it's always good to have talent. Mm -hmm. But in many ways, the director is king in mm -hmm. film. And the tone of the film, the look of the film. By the way, do you understand that I appreciate the cinema? Cinematography, oh, yeah. and I thought the film looked mm -hmm. beautiful. Oh, absolutely. It Weren't you proud of that? Unbelievably so. And it helps you know what you're trying to do as an actor. If the setting you're placed into is just, it's not that it's gorgeous. It's more than gorgeous. It just, ev it's evocative. You were able to create an evocative sense of that film where we were in a different age. Mm -hmm. And not every film can do that. Some, and it doesn't mean that the film isn't good, but sometimes without the evocative sense, 
it, it's a little bit sterile. Your film is not sterile. It's just magnificent. Okay, so you create this mood, mm -hmm. and then you have a theme, and you're working on the theme. Mm -hmm. And I want to know if the fact that your father read to you Holocaust literature when you were a child, and now you're doing a film, and John is right. This, and I said it carefully in the open. This is not a Holocaust right. film, mm -hmm. but there's a Holocaust element mm -hmm. to the film, mm -hmm. and it will, it will, it has a very important part in the development of character. Right. I want to know the extent to which, without leading you at all, to what extent did that mean something to you? Do you feel in any way you were drawn to it? or that it mo motivated you as you created the, as you shaped the film? Well, to get to the theme of Beshert, um, I didn't know that the film was about that until somewhere in the editing room when I went, oh my God, this is what this film is about. Explain to me how that is. I mean, the, the Beshert is in the script. I put it there. After the fact? No. While we're you, shooting. Somehow you felt it? Yes. I put it, the writer did not, he, he's not Jewish, he didn't know Beshert. You are brilliant too. <laughs> <laughs> you are two brilliant people. It is brilliant. You have to see this. The way in which the Beshert is discovered is, is, it is, it gives you chills. It gives me chills. You understand that? You, by the way, you didn't write that though. No. That's in that's the script. That's the true incident. That's the only true incident. Are in the you whole kidding? Script. That no. is because it's you know, up comes this line, you know, based on a true incident. That's the true. That's, that's the, the only uh, the true kernel of truth that makes this film. That's it. Okay, but it wasn't called Beshert in the script. No, I I made it Beshert. I said this is this is about Beshert, and so I put those lines in. Did you write any other lines? No, John helped on the script. John, Did you write some lines? Yeah. Uh, I, I, was, I was grateful to have some input into the script. Yes. Absolutely. And I was grateful Absolutely. to have his input. No. But I, I, I don't want to take anything away from no, James. No, he wrote a He wrote a beautiful screenplay, but John <clears throat> did come in and um, took a pass at it and, and added some beautiful touches to it. We have everything we need in front of us. We just have to be able to see it. You remember that line? Mm -hmm. You utter that line. Yes. You know that's a very Jewish idea. The Jewish idea is that the miraculous is all around us. Mm -hmm. the, not, the question is not when did the miracle occur. The question is when do, when do human beings see it? It's, it's done with the burning bush. You know the burning bush from the story of the Exodus? Moses is in the wilderness, and he sees the burning bush, and the rabbis ask the question, when did that bush start to burn? And the answer in the Midrash, it was always burning. The question is, when would Moses see it? Mm -hmm. So when you utter that line in the, in the movie, it's very powerful to me. Mm. Um, you're Max, and you meet Joy. And it's an accidental meeting, and the, the, the idea in this film is that it, it ends up being beshared. And the question is, where will the two of you go, and will you go anywhere together? And the answer, you have to watch the film to see it. But in the film, Joy wants to know about you. She wants to know about your life, meaning the character's life. And one of the things that you must do to satisfy her, to, to further the relationship is, she wants to know what your experiences were as a survivor. And in the, in the movie you created, Max is reluctant, and she's insistent. And she says to you, what was it like? And you, at one point, the character says to her, you want to know about how hungry I was all the time? And then the character, with this unusual view of life, says, you know, and I'm, I'm a little bit paraphrasing, Jews don't eat on Yom Kippur. We fast. So I imagined I was fasting every day. And at one point, she says to you, at what point do you realize that it's more than your fasting every day? This is your life. And the character talks about all the things 
And so this is not a gory film. This is not a Showa film. But in very simple but, but powerful, almost asides, the character of Max reveals things about what it was like to endure the camp. And one, she says to you at one point, you know, when do you realize that the people who leave you, you're never going to see them again? And the character's answer is, I see them all the time in essence. They're dancing in the street. They're never gone. Oh, it's, a very, it's a very lovely idea that the people we love, if you have imagination, you can look out the window, they're always dancing in the street. And it touched me. Now, so I'm sharing, I'm sharing my reaction to your film. As you hear me talk about the film, do you say to yourself, oh, that's interesting, or, gee, that's lovely, he got it. No, that's what I think. I mean, I actually got teary-eyed when you were telling the story. I was like, wow, that's really, that's powerful. Um, even the dancing in the street, as I've seen the movie several times in the past couple of months, I see how layered it is. Yes. And I didn't, I didn't when I was editing, I didn't realize how important that line was because he says it three times. That's right. And I went, wow, we really placed it. We had a great editor. I mean, really, his name is Jim Mole. He's just beautiful. He understood it in such a way. And, um, uh, and now when I look at it about the dancing in the street, I get moved because I think, wow, that's such a theme that I didn't realize I was, I was really pressing. You did. You did. It's, it's so interesting as a director to see things that you, you did so, um, unconsciously. Yes. But somewhere in you, you knew it. And then when you see it, you go, God, did I do that? You know, that's what it feels like. I, sometimes when I direct a play, I go back to it in about two months after it's running, and I think, did I, did I do that? Because, or did they make it their own because it becomes their own? So now when I look at this movie, I think, did I do that? Because it doesn't feel like mine anymore. It feels like it's something else. You should be very proud. You did it, and it's really wonderful. Um, again, so, so I'm not giving away how what the shared is. I'm already, I've already said that in this movie, the characters, the, Max very much wants to be with Joy. Mm -hmm. And the question is, will Joy join him or not? And... A, a secondary theme of Bashir was Max saying to her, her you are saying to the character, I feel like everything that happened to me was to bring me here to be with you for you to put your, sh your head on my shoulder. You have to see the movie to know why that's an issue. And I'm, and again, you're acting. But we all understand that we do need another person's shoulder from time to time. And the most important person we can put our shoulder, our head on is someone who loves us. And when you watch the film or when you think about how you did the scenes, and I'm saying this over and over again, I fell in love with Max, which means you did a spectacular job. I wanted to know him, I wanted, you know, and there was something, and even, it's even referenced in the film, there's something childlike about him, but it's childlike in the most lovely, lovely loving way. Do you agree with me? Absolutely. It's not silly romantic, it's not silly child, and you're even, it's referred to in the script, but it is a loveliness that comes, bubbles up from the soul, and so. Thank you, Mark. I, mean, I don't even know what I want you to answer, but I'm describing something I experienced as a simple viewer. I am just moved by the character, by your smile. My goodness, don't you fall in love with this guy's smile? <laughs> well, yeah. You know? Yeah. But to answer that question, because he can't answer it, there is so much about Max that is John. John is, I mean, when anybody talks about John, it's always what a genuine, sweet, kind, 
generous person he is. I mean, I'm thrilled it's, to hear that. It's always superlatives because he, he just is, and I don't know that many genuine people, and John truly is one of them. I mean, if, if you want to root for anybody, it would be somebody like John. You go, oh, God, I want, I, I want to root for him because yes. he We don't need to embarrass you. <laughs> <laughs> We're just describing you. <laughs> so you, you speak up. What did it mean to you to play that character given who you are? Well, you know, without a, hopefully without giving too much away, yeah. uh, Max is, is of the mind uh, that I am in the sense of if you give life long enough, it always makes sense in the end. No matter what it is that you're going through, if you are given enough time and you look back, you say, oh, that's why this happened, that's why this happened, because I wouldn't be here right now without it. And um, I, I think that's such an important uh, perspective to put out there right now because everybody is going through their, their tough times. Absolutely. I mean, I, I know very few people that are not dealing with their own significant tragedy in one way or another, and there's only, you know, so much you can be a shoulder for someone to cry on or not, but what I've found when, when consoling friends and what people have said to me is, hey, give it, give it some time and you'll see. You'll, you'll understand why you're going through this right now. And so here we have a case where you've got two people who have been through extreme tragedy, yes. and one of them is convinced that this is the night. This is the night that all of that was about, and I have to be right. And the other one doesn't know. She's, you know, she's, her, her faith is not the same as his. It's so It's worse uh, than that. Oh, yeah. It's worse than that. She has in her mind a different trajectory. Mm -hmm. And you change that, you, I keep saying you. <laughs> the character you play changes that trajectory. And we understand, understand, we as the viewer understand the power that changes her trajectory. And you had to communicate that, and you did it brilliantly. That, that's, you know. What do you want to do next? Well, I, uh, I want to keep making movies with Jennifer Gelfer, is what I want to do. My wife, Claudia, who, you know, you said lovely things about in she this movie. Terrific. Stars she's, in my next movie. She's the lead, and oh, the one. Which that, we've already shot. Yeah, really, what is your next movie? It's called Diary. And, Diary. And we're just in the finishing stages. Um, and um, we should be finished next week. We shot and it last In general, time. what's the storyline in general? May, may, may you do it. You do. I, uh, he wrote it. It's, it's, you wrote it. I, yes. I wrote it and, uh, and got to produce it. I bet it it's for, fabulous. For um, <laughs> I, I, I'll say this. It's a, um, it's a feminist thriller for the Instagram generation. Mm -hmm. And when I look at The Second Son... And I look at <laughs> Diary, and I think the same woman made these two films. It blows my mind. Polar opposites. Um, the, 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 the through line with both of them is the heart that, that Jennifer brings to everything she does. But it's uh, Claudia's. She's just incredible. I'm not saying this because I'm, I'm no. the, the proud husband. I, I, I am. But uh, it's, it's not a matter of opinion. She explodes off that screen and gives us the entire 360 journey of what it's like to be a young woman in this day and age who's using Instagram modeling to pay for her uh, master's degree in comparative religion. And she's brilliant and dealing with all of that. Um, I won't give too much of the plot away. But, all right, uh, that's enough. <laughs> that is really wonderful. And you and I spoke again a moment. We have a, a very special person we share in our lives, Julian Schlossberg. Incredible man. And you're gonna, you may be doing what with Julian? Uh, Julian is gonna be uh, producing an adaptation of uh, the book of interviews I did with my father called The Big Empty. Uh, it's been adapted now into a uh, three-person play by uh, an amazingly sweet and talented guy named Ronald K. Freed. And it's really, it's, you know, when, when Ron first came to me and said, hey, I want to adapt this into a play, I said, you know, it's a book of interviews, right? There's not a lot of drama. <laughs> but, uh, and he said, no, it's, the, you know, it's a son coming to terms with the imminent death of his father when his father is Norman Mailer, and how does, how does one do that? And, and for myself, writing that book was very much part of it. I wanted to give kind of a Norman Mailer 101. Uh, for the 12 people that read it, I think they probably got it. Uh, but my hope is that w uh, under the uh, amazing uh, guide of Julian, uh, that the play will do what I what I hoped the book would do. Was it a cathartic process for you? Oh yeah, I mean it's uh, it's it's wild because I, I'm a character in it, and so oftentimes people say, well, why don't you just play the part? 
And I said, you think I want to live this journey eight times a week? <laughs> <laughs> I did it, man. Let someone else do it now. <laughs> um, so You're it's, not uh, acting in I'm it. I'm not going to act in it. You're no. just the writer. I, I'm, not, I'm not even the writer. They just uh, uh, oh, somebody optioned, adapted they, yeah, it. They optioned the book and, and adapted it. I, I was there as a consultant. Are to, you pleased to, with the way it's shaped? Incredibly so. Okay. Incredibly so. Anyway, yeah. Julian is one of the sweetest, most talented human beings I have ever met, and he literally... Um, had an enormous influence on my life, and I ended up in theater because of Julian Schlossberg. Mm. And so mm. I, would, I am happy to share him with you, and and you're lucky to be able to, in some way, be under his wing. But that's wonderful. Mm. And you now have just done Diary. Diary, and I just acted for the first time in about ten years. In what? In a movie called Right Now. The working title is Nightingale, but. Um, it's going to be called something else because actually there's a movie opening today know, called The Nightingale. Called The Nightingale. But right. So, um, yeah, and that, was, that was an experience because I haven't had anybody direct me in all these years. I've only been directing. And even anything I would do, I would direct myself in something. But was it hard to, um, be, to be directed? Yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's honest. It just was yes. because I think I know better than everybody else. Yes. <laughs> so that, that became difficult. But but it was a great experience. But you you did actually listen to your director and oh, went yeah. along and, and didn't do what uh, Oh no what some, what some actors have done. So okay, that's nice and then go do whatever you want no, to no, do. No, no. I know? took his notes and I yeah. took what he had to say. He had wonderful things to say, but it's you know, you think you know better. I know exactly. This exactly. is a, a writer director named Matt Berkowitz who uh, produced diary for us. And we thought, let's, let's scratch his back and, and produce this one. Okay. Uh, You're a creative team. Mm -hmm. So together, what's your vision and what do you hope to do? Well, my mission is to give new talent, whether, whatever their age is, give talent that hasn't been tapped an opportunity. Because it was so difficult for me, the business end of this, I, when I see talent that is ha not even having a tough time, but that should be getting somewhere, I want to nurture that and push them forward. So for me, that's what this is about. I'm not, I'm not into um, hiring big star names and um, making movies like that. I'm into intimate stories that put the artist first. Um, so that's sort of why I started this. That is wonderful, and you do it brilliantly. And how do you see the creative team here? Uh, I mean, I am completely in, in tune with the need to have a, a place where new talent can be discovered. It's, uh, as a working actor, it is so hard to get these opportunities I now. Know. People, you know, friends of mine who are big stars right. are having a hard time getting That's great work. People that you don't, know, it's, even if you're a star, it doesn't mean you can uh, work next week. Right. Absolutely. But I mean, what I, what I hope I can also bring to that, too, is this, I guess what has been kind of a lifelong mission that started with my dad of creating stories that, that on an intergenerational level can act as, as a way for communication between people of all ages. Good for and you. And that's a... And I think, I think if I had to say what was it about, or what is it about the second son that pleases me the most? And I'm looking at this not only as somebody who's in theater and as somebody who, who loves film, but also as a rabbi. And I'm saying to myself, the quintessential message of the Jewish tradition is it's all about people and relationships. What the two of you did with Eden's help is create a beautiful story about two people and about how two people are important to each other and how they're important to each other and how they grow in importance to each other and how in a very complicated, a complicated world and life we live where relationships are very complicated. Every now and then, you find somebody who makes the world better for you mm -hmm. and completes the world for you. And in one way or another, it's beshared, mm -hmm. but it's also a product of people willing to love each other. And that's the, what you created. Each of you had your own very special role. I am very proud to have had you on the Chaim. I am proud to tell our audience about the second son. All of our audience can watch the second yes, son. Yes. Wherever you are, you can. <laughs> on Amazon Prime at the very beginning. 
your name is John Buffalo Mailer. <laughs> I said to you, is Buffalo your real name? You said, because I assumed it was a nickname. You were named John Buffalo Mailer. What's that? Well, you know, the truth is it was a secret between my mother, my father, and myself. The only, only the three of us knew. And now they've passed. So only I know. <laughs> oh, my God, are you going to tell us? I can't tell you <laughs> um, at, this, at this moment. Uh, I, and I understand. I, I wonder, you know, because my, my wife doesn't know. Jennifer doesn't know. Your wife doesn't know? My no, wife doesn't know. know. My siblings don't know. And I've always wondered, you know, do I just take this with me? Or do I write a little note on a bottle and create a treasure hunt? What, you know, what do I do for those that care? Either way um, is the right way. Absolutely. Either way, either way. Yeah. I will say, though, it's the right name. Yes, it's the right it name. is. The American beast, the, the weird <laughs> Jewish cowboy. They knew what they were. I am thrilled. You're, with. Yes. <laughs> you said that your father could look at somebody and understand that your mother was special, and they gave you a special name, John. It is wonderful to meet you. It is wonderful to highlight your work. I hope this is only the first of many times we're together, both on camera and off camera, Jennifer. You are very talented, and you're a lovely, lovely person. So Thank it's you. been an honor to feature you on on Lachaim and JBS, and you, John, are a treasure. You're an absolute treasure. I, I say the same thing to you. In Hebrew, it's kol tuv You should only go and have goodness and success. Everywhere you go, you should write and you should act. And I hope that I'm you know, privileged enough every now and then to share your company, but to always thrill in your work. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so thank you. much. Mazal tov to you. I do want to tell you my beshert story, though. Oh, please, we'll okay. end that way. All right. Um, last night I was having dinner with some friends, and um, my friend who I've known since we were two years old, she said, I was watching this, this uh, show. It was like on midnight, and she said, it's a talk show. And she said, and it was like the Jewish PBS. And now I hadn't told her anything. And she said, and I really like it. And I said, well, what is it? And she said, it's the Jewish Broadcasting Service. And I said, I'm doing that show tomorrow. And everybody just, we, the three of us just went, what? And she, I said, I'm doing, I said, is it called L'Chaim? She goes, yes. And she started telling me about these two female documentarians that were on the night before and how she was caught up in it and that she just loved this show. And she, she said, and now I, and they moved from um, Spectrum to Verizon, so she went home right away to find out if she got it because now she's on Verizon. She called me and she said, I have it, it's on channel 720. She says, I'm going to watch this. And it was just so funny, I thought, how, how beshared that she brought it up out of nowhere. She just brought up, and I said, I'm doing that show tomorrow. And then today, we were on the phone talking to an interviewer, and he asked me about the woman, the character of the woman in the movie who um, comes into the pastry shop after Joy and Max have been together and comes into the pastry shop. And he was asking me some questions about her. And as he's asking me those questions, the phone rang, and it was her. And I said, well, she's calling right now. <laughs> right? Yes. And, I, and so it's just sort of like happening. Like, it keeps happening. I'm like, oh my god, it's not good. Until the movie opens, I'm just going to be hit with Bashir. <laughs> <laughs> That is such a wonderful story. It gave me chills. Well, I'm so, I mean, I couldn't believe it. And, and actually the fact that I saw Julian Schlossberg yesterday I yes. mentioned the show, and he said, oh, yeah, it's my friend Mark. Uh, it's just. Uh, it's, it really is Beshert. It's Beshert. Well, yeah. it's a perfect way to end because it's the theme of your movie. Yeah. And Mazal Tov again, and thank yeah. you. Thank you, thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you Mark. Thank you. <laughs> John Buffalo Mailer, star of The Second Son as well as the director, Jennifer Gelfer, who did a spectacular job creating a touching, powerful, moving film that has a Holocaust theme. It's a soft Holocaust theme, an important Holocaust theme. And at the same time, it is a magnificent love story. I hope you all get to see it, if not in the theater, on Amazon Prime. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. And remember, you can take L'Chaim now everywhere you go, 
on a podcast, whether it's Google Play or I, whatever it is, wherever you get your podcast, you can now download L'Chaim and take it with you. You can hear my conversation with John and Jennifer again. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends. Life. would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.